I think it's more difficult because the, the language is so hard and it's, uh, it's, um, it's also hard for me because we're in a, what I think, a transition zone between the way we used to organize these and I probably have them organized in some old way and now they're being organized in a new way and I'm having trouble with that transition most likely. The problem is I don't know how Pants organizes this information. So I'm going to try to use the, the um, vocabulary and nomenclature of sort of the old and the new so that you can get a feel for uh, what some of these things are. All right, so what we're going to be talking about uh, is the nephrotic syndromes and the nephritic syndromes and they're, uh, they're somewhat different and I'm going to try really hard through this morass of nomenclature to point out the kinds of things that you really need to be concentrating on because simply memorizing this material will burn up it, it'll just burn up so much energy that is not very necessary okay so, the glomerular diseases <clears throat> are sort of distinguished by the clinical presentation, the urinalysis, the amount of protein in the urine, um, and the associations with other disease manifestations, like we were talking earlier, uh, lupus and Sjogren's, and those autoimmune diseases. Same thing is true with these glomerular diseases. They're sometimes associated with other illnesses that make it easier to understand what's going on in the kidney. Okay, so the first thing we want to talk about, and this definition is remarkably important. I guarantee you that something about this definition will be on your exam, and something about this definition will be on the pants exam. You've got to be able to distinguish whether someone has an nephrotic syndrome or not. Nephrotic syndrome is protein area of 3,500 grams, 3.5 three and a half. Three and a half 3,500 grams of protein in 24 hours. They excrete that much in their urine. Okay? They have hyperlipidemia, usually. They have edema, usually. They have hypoalbuminemia. Okay? Now let's just think a little bit about this syndrome. If it's presenting where you're, you're peeing out all your protein, you're peeing out protein to the extent that's higher than you can put it in. It doesn't matter how many steaks you eat. You cannot raise your serum protein when you have nephrotic syndrome. So if you're peeing out all your protein, how are you going to present clinically? Sick. What? Very sick. Muscle weakness, maybe. You're not going to be feeling so good. The most prominent thing is you have edema. And there's a term called anasarca. Have you heard that term? Anasarca is how people with nephrotic syndrome usually present. They have edema everywhere. We, we usually think of look, looking for pitting edema over the anterior tibia because that's what we have access to during the exam. But these people have periorbital edema, they have edema of the scalp, they have edema of their whole body. They have this edema because their serum protein is so low that water leaves the vascular space and enters the interstitial space. There are two things that keep water in the vessel. But, uh, albumin or protein. and blood pressure, the pressure inside the vessel. If the pressure gets too high, fluid moves. If the oncotic pressure gets too low, fluid moves. Water moves, salt, salt moves, okay? So these people have anasarca usually. They have hyperlipidemia, um, I'm not exactly sure why. I think they have hyperlipidemia because their liver is over trying to overproduce albumin and it can't get it done. 
um, and they have hypoalbuminemia because they're losing it in their kidneys. There's only one other place you could lose. You really only get hypoalbuminemia in three ways. One is if you pee it out. One is if you poop it out. That's really uncommon. Uh, having a gastrointestinal, a gastrointestinal disease where you, where you have diarrhea that's composed primarily of protein. Did you study that in GI? It's really, un it's really uncommon. It's really unrare. <laughs> it's really uncommon and um, probably why you didn't study it. But uh, You can also get hypoalbuminemia if you starve yourself. Those are really the only three ways you can get low protein in the blood. But this definition of nephrotic syndrome is really important. You don't have to have all four of these to have nephrotic syndrome. What you do have to have is high, that 3,500 grams of protein in your urine. Is that, is that right? Is that, is that definition correct? Is it three and a half grams, 3.5 grams, 3,500 milligrams? It is, isn't it? That's wrong right there. Yeah, that's 3.5 grams or 3,500 milligrams. Did you recognize that was wrong, Brooks, and didn't tell me? I was just thinking of mine last year. I had 3.5 grams. You had what, 3.5 grams? Yeah, that's what it is. It's 3.5 grams. 3,500 grams is way too much. That's, 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 a, that's a train load. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to go through the conditions that are associated with nephrotic syndrome. So let's get this straight. Patients present with nephrotic syndrome recognized by the provider as big-time edema. Then you start looking, right? They got big time edema. I'm all swole up. And you start looking and you look at their urine and you examine them and so forth. And then you you know that their their protein, a lot of protein in their urine, just because you did a dipstick, it was really highly positive for protein. So now you quantitate it with a 24 hour urine. Have you talked about how to collect a 24 hour urine? No. Don't do it? Yeah, we what they told us. It's unrealistic. Oh my god, who told you that? McNeil? Uh, oh yeah. A nephrologist? Yeah. What did he say to do? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what? She more lucky donuts. You can do it. Yeah. You find a little bit better? Yeah. So you told us. <laughs> Let him lose his eyes. Let the patient decide. Yeah. <laughs> patient centered care. <laughs> kind empath empathy. <laughs> so, a nephrologist told you don't collect the 24 hour urine. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. spot to check. Yes. What? Did you hear she said, you know, it, she said that the reason why is because patients don't know how to collect them correctly and it's arduous for the patient to do it. And she says a spot urine is just as helpful as a 24 hour urine. In her, in her clinical practice. But I, when I was in internal medicine, I ordered 24 hour urine. And when she said that, I was like, yeah, So okay. don't leave this program thinking that 24 hour urines are worthless. They're not worthless. They're easy to do. I, I think that what you heard, and this is an interesting, this is an interesting problem. We've talked about this before. I don't know who this nephrologist was, but I'm I'm not talking about a particular person. But I am talking about the bias that's built into medical practice. If it was a nephrologist telling you that, there's a default. What's she going to do to try to figure out what's wrong with these patients? A renal biopsy. If you're going to biopsy everybody who has a lot of protein in their urine, a lot, 
even 30, even three grams, then you don't need to do 24 hour hair But if you're taking nephrology boards, you're not going to biopsy them unless there's an indication to do so. And just having some protein in urine ain't no indication for doing a biopsy. What we're going to, what we're going to learn is that most of these patients we're going to talk about in this lecture need a, need a kidney biopsy. And that may be where she's coming from. She can tell, she can tell without doing a 24 hour urine, that they're going to need a biopsy anyway, so she just goes ahead and biopsies. But, but that's not how you should learn this. Here's how you collect the 24 hour urine. It's really simple. You get up in the morning at the time you usually get up. If you don't get up at the same time every morning, you set an alarm. You set the alarm for 7 o'clock. You get up. The first thing you do is you go to the commode and empty your bladder. You've now got a bucket to pee in for the rest of the 24 hours. And you pee in it and you keep it in the refrigerator. So all the urine you make until your alarm goes off tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock, you pee in this bucket. Tomorrow morning, when your alarm goes off at 7 o'clock, you go in and pee in the bucket. You've got all the urine you made in 24 hours. Period. End of conversation. That is not difficult. You've got to do it at the same time, two mornings in a row. The first morning, you've got to pee in the commode. The second morning, you pee in the, in the bucket. That isn't hard. But it does take a little bit of time to explain to the patient. And then you tell them, tell me about it. how are you going to collect this? Because it's so unusual to put your urine in a container instead of come out, that they're going to have to do something to, to remind them not to pee in the commode. They're going to have to have a sign on the commode. They're going to have to have a sign on the steering wheel of the car that says, don't pee when you're at the, have you peed? Don't go to the mall without peeing first. You know, go into your bladder. But it's not difficult, so it, it's really relatively easy. <clears throat> Any other questions, comments about misinformation you've gotten from nephrologists? One day I found out why people get um, high cholesterol. You were right with the liver. Chronic, they say. Um, the hyponatri or hypoproteinuria and low serum on body pressure caused by nephrotic syndrome um, leads to reactive hepatic protein synthesis, including the liver proteins. Yeah. The only way you get protein is you make it in the liver or you eat it. But mostly you make it in the liver so your liver gets geared up. But does it say that the liver then makes, does lipoprotein. the liver make cholesterol? Makes lipoproteins. Makes lipoprotein. Oh, yeah. Okay. Like so the overproduction of lipoprotein comes out as an elevated. Right. Okay. All right, um, so now what we've got is we've got a patient who um, has uh, nephrotic levels of protein in the urine, and we're going to talk about the conditions that are associated with it. Focal segmental glomerulonephritis. The diagnosis is made by renal biopsy. That's going to be the case with almost all these. <laughs> it's more common in African Americans than in Northern Europeans, but we don't know why. And the treatment is glucocorticoids and calcineurin inhibitors. Uh, the treatment for almost all of these is going to be cortisone, glucocorticoids. Calcineurin inhibitors is going to be common too. Second is the membranous glomerulopathy. Diagnosis is made by renal biopsy, most common cause in white adults. And then it might be associated with these infections and malignancy, um, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, malaria, syphilis. So the way I did these things when I was in practice as a general internist is I would see someone with bad edema, had protein big on their dipstick, I'd get a 24-hour urine, I would say, well, they need a renal biopsy. So I get a nephrology consult, and the nephrologist biopsies their kidneys, right? 
once I get the biopsy report back, then I go back to the books or to my computer and say, okay, what's, the, what's on the list for membranous glomerulopathy? Now I've got it narrowed down where I can deal with a list that I can deal with. I don't memorize all this stuff to carry it around in my hip pocket or in my brain. The brain isn't built to do that. The brain is built to solve problems. Your computer is built to, to remember these things. So use the computer the way it's supposed to be. So you got to especially look, if you get a biopsy back that says membranous glomerulopathy, you got to look for infections and you got to look for malignancies because those are the things you can treat. So up to 30% of people with membranous glomerulopathy resolve spontaneously within six months. Um, patients who persist after six months or those who have a thrombotic or, or embolic event should be treated. Now, people with membranous glomerulopathy, for reasons that I'm not completely quite sure of, have more commonly thrombotic episodes. Now, why would you get a thrombotic episode just because you have nephrotic syndrome? No, lipids don't cause clotting. They lead to atherosclerosis, but they don't lead to clots. Mm -hmm. There is an inflammatory response? Yeah, there is an inflammatory response. But it's the same reason they get hyperlipidemia. Their liver is building the proteins that cause clotting, right? Protein C, protein S. Um, it's uh, uh, the factors that lead to intrinsic clotting are being pumped out by the liver in an attempt to make protein. And so um, they have an increased likelihood of presenting with just renal vein thrombosis or deep vein thrombosis. Okay? And the treatment, if they last over six months, is glucocorticoids, sometimes cyclophosphamide, and then again, calcineurin inhibitors. You're going to see these same drugs on all of these diseases. Then there's something called minimal change glomerulopathy. Most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in children. That's probably important to know, um, especially if you're in family medicine or pediatrics. If a child presents with nephrotic syndrome, they probably have minimal change glomerulopathy if you're playing the odds. They're going to require a, a, a biopsy regardless, but um, this is most likely what they have. Now there are causes, um, sometimes you don't know what the cause is, but sometimes there are medications. NSAIDs, lithium, they're on the same, same list, and interferons. Pemendronate, have you come across that drug yet? Pemendronate is a, is a drug that is used for osteoporosis. Uh, children wouldn't be taking that but, unless they were born with soft bones, but um, adults with viral infections, malignancies, I don't know. It's not important that Hodgkin's disease and thymoma are related. If they have a thymoma or a Hodgkin's disease, you're probably going to find it in some way other than them getting nephrotic syndrome. And there again, you treat them. Same list of three plus rituximab. Which one is rituximab? Is that hum hum Humira? I can't ever. Is that? Is that? No. What is it? Humira is the A1. It's the A1? Yeah. Rituximab. It's what? Rituximab. 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 Okay. So it's. It's one of those biologic anti-inflammatory. Okay, diabetic ne nephropathy. That says neuropathy. It should say diabetic nephropathy. Diabetic nephropathy is the most common cause of end-stage kidney disease in the United States. So most people who come in, practitioners off the United States with an elevated creatinine, it's because they have diabetes because they cannot 
keep themselves from eating donuts. <laughs> hey, I'm looking up for you. I'm telling you, I'm, a, I'm dialysis waiting to happen right here. <laughs> Renal biopsy is not indicated unless there's a suspicion of another glomerulopathy. So this is sort of a, one of those thought things. If you've been taking care of a patient who's had diabetes for 30 years, 20 years, um, and their gravity is high, it's prob what's probably wrong with their kidneys is they have diabetes. Um, and so unless you find some other reason for them to have glomerulopathy, you don't need to do a renal biopsy just to see if they have what we call chemostill Wilson disease, which is the glomerulopathy due to uh, diabetes. And the treatment is really <coughs> glycemic control. <coughs> There's pretty good evidence that if a diabetic will keep their hemoglobin A1C um, between six and six and a half, the likelihood of developing glomerulopathy is way down. And the length of time it takes to get glomerulopathy is a lot longer. So the key to diabetes care is diagnose it early and then somehow convince them to control their blood sugar. Once they get glomerulopathy, you're probably not going to, you're not going to reverse it at all. And you may or may not be able to keep it from getting worse. Okay, so that's nephrotic syndrome. Mostly, the thing you have to worry about is how you, how you recognize it. Okay, and you recognize it mostly by having three and a half grams of protein or more in the urine. Yeah. This is really a simple question, but the product syndrome. So uh, the first slide is that every of these other conditions, the condition is associated with the product syndrome. So what comes first? Is it these things cause the product syndrome, or that's what? That, that yeah, you have to have something wrong with the kidney to get the product. Right, okay. And this is the list of things that does that. Yeah, we'll call it that. The problem is that people with nephritic syndrome, which we're getting ready to talk about now, can also have nephrotic amounts of protein in here. So let's just talk about the name. We're not going to talk about nephritic syndrome. Let's just talk about this word. What does the term nephritic syndrome make you think of? Inflammation. Okay, that's, that's, that's good. That's exactly what it is. These are diseases more associated with inflammatory response of some sort. Uh, but they can be so bad that they can have nephrotic amounts of urine. So some of these people with nephrotic syndrome can have nephrotic syndrome as well. Now the hallmark of nephritic syndrome <coughs> is that they have hematuria. In fact, they have dysmorphic red cells. Did any one of the neurolog nephrologists also tell you you didn't need to look at urine under the microscope? They said you should look at it under the microscope. Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a really important thing to do. In, in modern day hospitals, it's difficult. If you don't have a lab in your office, it's impossible. So, most of the time, you're going to order a urinalysis, you're going to send it somewhere else. And there's no way for you to look. So you get a report back that says there's hematuria. You may not get a report back that says there's not only hematuria, but these red cells are highly dysmorphic. But if you were able to look at it yourself, you'd be able to recognize the dysmorphic red cells under the microscope. There are white cells and there's protein. There may or may not be red cell casts and white cell casts depending upon how bad the inflammation is and where the inflammation is.
Okay, so it's inflammation. There are three pathophysiologic mechanisms. One is anti-glomerular basement membrane antibodies. Does that term make sense to you? These are antibodies generated against the basement membrane of the glomerulus. Posse immune glomerulonephritis. Posse means very little, small amount. So the, these are necrotizing glomerulitis. What does that mean? It means that when the pathologist looks at the glomerulus under the microscope, they see necrosis of the glomerulus, but very little um, immune complexes when they stain it for Im Im immunology or as an antibody. And then immune complex deposition, which is um, where the whole thing that's wrong here is an immune complex attacking the glomerulus. An immune complex is defined by an antibody and an antigen with or without complement attached. Have you studied complement, serum complement? Mm -hmm. So the, the serum complement that we're worried about in these disorders is C3 and C4. <clears throat> so when patients present with what looks like an nephritic syndrome, they have protein and red cells and white cells and stuff in their urine, um, one of the things we get is a serum complement level. The first two pathophysiologic mechanisms have normal serum complement levels. If the third pathophysiologic process is in, involved, immune complex deposition, then their serum complements will be low. So serum complement levels, especially C3 and C4, are tests that we order sort of up front as we're getting ready to uh, get the nephrologist involved try to figure this out. And the way the nephrologist is going to figure it out is biopsy the kidney. Now we're going to run through conditions that cause nephritic syndrome. And this speaks to your question. Look at the first, the first uh, condition is rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, RPGN. <laughs> It can be associated with any cause of nephritic syndrome. So this term is only built to define the fact that it happened really fast. It doesn't really talk about what's on the pathology slide. It just means that it was rapid and it was progressive. It's aggressive. It happened quickly. Renal failure occurs rapidly. They may present in a near it. They may show up and say, I quit peeing. I don't have any urine. And they may be having rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. They may be associated with arthritis, uh, bloody nose, coughing up blood, lung hemorrhage. ANCA. Have you heard of ANCA yet? Anti neutrophilic cytoplasm. What, in what circumstance did you learn about ANCA? Ulcerative colitis. What? Ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis. Is it present in all ulcerative colitis? Is it? So, ANCA is uh, something that you have to worry about in glomerulopathies. It's it's, it's a thing you have to worry about in any angiitis. Anytime you're worried about is, are the, is it the arterioles or the arteries that are inflamed, you have to worry about is this anti-neutrophilic cytoplasmic cytoplasm antibody because it categorizes the angiitis. Um, there are plasma, membrane, anti-membrane, 
antibodies, anti-GBM. And then there's an immunofluorescence microscopy on the biopsy specimen. So when they get the biopsy specimen, they'll do several stains on it, and one of them will be an immunofluorescence stain, and the immunofluorescence stain will be the one that tells you um, that there are immune complexes attacking the, the, uh, the Marinus membrane. So if you if you have a patient with rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, um, you give you give them all except those associated with an infection high doses of steroids, huge doses of steroids. They usually also get cyclophosphamide, and they may also get plasmapheresis. Have you talked about plasmapheresis, where the blood is taken out and run through a machine that takes all the all the complexes off, takes all these immune complexes off, puts the blood back in the body. Focal segmental glomerulonephritis, more common in African American people. Um, it can be associated with diabetes, it can be associated with hypertension, obesity, sickle cell disease. Um, I don't know if I don't know if obesity causes this. It's just associated with it. I don't think it causes it. It's like obesity doesn't cause diabetes either. Um, it's just a risk factor. HIV and drugs again, pemidronate and interferon can do this. Um, sort of like sort of like uh, lithium. Interferon is a bad is a bad actor. But it's so powerful a drug in some illnesses that it's continuing to be used. Um, and, and again, the diagnosis is always made of biopsy. Only a minority of these people uh, spontaneous resolve. And uh, so they're treated with glucocorticoids and calcineurin inhibitors. Um, anti glomerular basement membrane antibody disease. Um, this is this is a term that I suppose could show up on pants, um, just because people who write test questions tend to like this kind of thing. They might ask you. They might put on uh, an answer: non-collagenous domain of type four collagen. It's something that kind of rolls off the tongue of. Uh, pathologist or someone who likes to memorize facts. That's what the antibody is in anti-glomerular basement membrane disease. In anti-glomerular basement membrane disease, one of the older known causes of nephritic nephrotic syndrome. And we know, because it's been around a long time, we know what the antibody is against. And it's against type 4 collagen. Of all the things you're going to hear today, I probably remember that. <clears throat> type 4 collagen is the antigen against which anti glomerular basement membrane antibody is made. The cause it very well might show up on the exam. Now, if the patient has this, they present with nephritic or nephrotic syndrome, and they're also coughing up blood, the chest x ray has some lesions on it, they have good pasture syndrome. Good pasture syndrome. They don't have good pasture syndrome unless they also have lung disease. They can have, they can have anti-glomerular basement membrane antibody disease without lesions in the lungs. But if they do have lesions in the lungs, then it's a new syndrome, good pasture. And so this is a this is a way to bring together at least two organ systems that are involved. We give it a name. Dr. Goodpasture is the one that figured this out, so we've got Goodpasture syndrome. That means you have lung disease and kidney disease. Um, this high anti-GBM antibodies, that's a blood test. So you can do a blood test looking for anti-glomerular basement membrane antibodies. You, and uh, it'll be high in the blood. So you can even get that before you do a, a, a kidney biopsy. They usually have normal complement levels. 
they have they have immune complex disease, but for some reason they, this complex, the antibody and the protein at, at the glomerular basement membrane doesn't fix complement for whatever reason. So you don't you have normal complement levels. And then the other thing I would memorize regarding anti-glomerular basement membrane disease is that you see crescents on the biopsy. You see them both in the kidney biopsy and you see them in the uh, pulmonary biopsy. And these are <clears throat> just like the crescents of the moon in uh, vessels. Crescents associated with anti glomerular basement membrane disease. And then again, you treat them with immunosuppressive therapy, glucocorticoid, cyclophosphamide, maybe plasmapheresis. The reason you do plasmapheresis is to try to decrease the blood level of these antibodies. Posse immune glomerulitis. Posse immune glomerulitis is caused by microscopic vessel vasculitis affecting the glomerulus with few or no immune deposits. The renal lesion can occur with or without a systemic vasculitis. And most patients have circulating anchor. Okay, there are three forms of this vasculitis. Um, and the thing I would remember about this is, so one of them is GPA, granulomatous with polyangiitis. What does polyangiitis mean? It just means that there are multiple blood vessels that are inflamed. Granulomatous means that there, is, there are granulomas on biopsy. Granulomas are these globs of anti or of inflammatory cells. This was formerly known. This is one of those where the old the old nomenclature was Wegener syndrome. So you just need to remember that Wegener syndrome is one of these posse immune glomerulonephritides. When you do the renal biopsy, you see granulomas on it. Microscopic polyangiitis, similar to GPA, but it doesn't have granulomas. And then you've got eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis. In this one, you have these granulomas, and they're packed full of eosinophils. And we used to call this Scherz Strauss syndrome. So, what I would do is I would remember that Scherz Strauss is associated with eosinophils. And it's one of the posse immune glomerulonephritides. Wegener's is associated with granulomatosis. And it's one of the posse immune glomerulonephritides. That way you will have remembered uh, both the old nomenclature and the new nomenclature. That makes sense? Okay, so this Posse syndrome um, can range from mild to some hematuria and proteinuria to rapidly progressive. So it can be, it can run the gamut to be mild to, to horrifically uh, aggressive. Um, and, and, and they might present, they present as if they're sort of chronically ill. They may have mild, grade, low grade fever, fatigue. I saw a young lady one time who's, who presented to her local physician in Ponca City with um, fever, fatigue, malaise, weight loss, um, and had been sick for about six weeks living in somewhere in the Caribbean. She was 22, 23 years old. Uh, she'd been living in the Caribbean and uh, working down there, and she kind of got sick. So she came home, which was Ponca City, 
went to the doctor and he looked at her, she had a high white blood cell count. He didn't find anything on physical exam. Had a white, high white blood cell count, a high sedimentation rate, uh, a shift to the left, so she had more polys than lymphocytes. Um, she had normal urine, she had a normal chest x-ray. She had high blood pressure. Her blood pressure was 170 over 90, 95. And um, he worked her up for an infection. Did blood cultures, urine cultures, did a chest x-ray, chest x-ray was normal. All the cultures were negative. Um, so he, he knew she had an infection. Why didn't he know she had an infection? fever, high white blood cell count, I said, so he calls an infectious disease doctor in Oklahoma City and sends her to him. He knows she has an infection, so he starts looking for an infection. And after a week in the hospital, he can't find the infection. He's furious. He takes it personally and he can't figure this out. And she also has high blood pressure. And she seems to have hypokalemia and metabolic alkalosis. What do you suppose the infectious disease doctor did with the high blood pressure, hypokalemia, and the metabolic alkalosis? He called an endocrinologist. It's not my baby, right? That's not an infection. That's an infe that's a that's an endocrine disease. So the endocrine guy comes and sees the patient, and what do you suppose he does? He, have you, you haven't had endo yet. He works the patient up for every endo disease that you can think of dealing with the adrenal gland. He does 24-hour urines for mineral corticoid, glucocorticoid, and blood tests, and has to figure out what endocrine disease she has. She's 22. She's 22. Here's a rule. If a young person is sick, they probably have one disease. If an old person is sick, they may have five, right? Old people have a, have a tendency to pick up stuff as they go through life. But young people shouldn't have two different diseases. She ought to have one disease causing all of this. So the infectious disease doc is making an error of the diagnostician, which is to look in the chest of drawers. He just looks in the chest of drawers that contains all of his diseases, all these infections, and he can't find one that fizzes him off. The endocrinologist does the same thing. He just looks in the drawers of all of his, of his endo diseases. He can't find it either. You're going to hear a lecture at 3 o'clock this afternoon it tells you what's wrong with this lady. When you have renal vascular diseases, that's the kidney and that's the renal artery. When you obstruct the renal artery and you, re you restrict the flow of blood into the kidney, the kidney realizes there's not enough blood coming. And it, it does several things. It increases uh, the reabsorption of sodium chloride. Uh, it increases the uh, call for mineralocorticoid. It feels as if the patient's bleeding to death, right? The kidney thinks, shit, I'm bleeding to death. That guy out there is bleeding to death, my host. I need to, I need to, I need to stay alive, so I'm going to increase the amount of sodium chloride I'm reabsorbing, and I'm going to increase mineral corticoid, which increases the amount of sodium chloride. It's doing everything it can to hold on to salt. When it does that, it causes the blood pressure to go up, because the blood pressure wasn't low in the first place, and it causes the kidney to excrete potassium and hydrogen ion 
cause metabolic alkalosis and hypokalemia with an increased blood pressure. That's what happens when you get renal vascular stenosis. So here's a young lady who looks like she has an infection, and she looks like she has renal vascular stenosis. She doesn't have a brewery. She doesn't have a big vessel. But maybe she's got inflammation that's not infection. All these people that have these inflammatory nephritic syndromes will have commonly have a hot wet cap. They'll commonly have an elevated set rate. They, they are inflamed. They are really inflamed, but they're not infected most of them. Okay? And she had a, 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 a form of vasculitis. She had vasculitis, it's called uh, polyarteritis, polyarteritis nodosa. She had arteritis of the median side blood vessels all over her body but it was most pronounced in her kidney. She could have presented with that most pronounced in her brain. She could have presented with that most pronounced in her lungs. The key, there are two, there are two, two lessons to this story. One is, keep your differential wide enough to include all the possible causes before you start narrowing it down. That's one of the problems with practicing specialized medicine. We don't do that. We narrow it down right away. And the second is, you got to look for something that <laughs> explains all the findings. You got to you got to be able to find. You got to explain all the findings in a young person. One thing is going to explain all the findings. Ninety-nine point nine percent of the time. So, leukocytoplastic vasculitis, pulmonary disease. Um, they commonly have a history of asthma, pulmonary infiltrates, eosinophilia. Um, because these are syndromes that cause uh, um, immune findings in other, other places. Um, so more than 80% of those with granulomatous and uh, microvascular uh, paucity uh, arteritis are, are anchor positive. Just remember that posse mostly anchor positive. And the continent levels are, are normal most of the time. Treatment's the same. Look, cortisacrophosphamide plasmapheresis. I guess you could use the same, well, if you got someone with all these diseases, just put them on glucose and hope, or just put them on glucocorticoids and hope for the best. <laughs> You'll sometimes see that then, actually. Um, and then the anti B cell drug. Uh, rituximab is sometimes used uh, because what's happening is a, a B cell clone is making these antibodies. Immune complex mediated. So there is a there is a um, most common cause. It's the prototypic cause: IgA nephropathy. IgA nephropathy is remarkably common. And you see it in young people. I've seen it in lots of college kids, young adults. And they come in for something else. For whatever reason, I get a urinalysis and they get hematuria. Uh-oh, what's going on? They have um, an IgA nephropathy that is causing inflammation of the glomerulus. You can't really make the diagnosis without a biopsy. And if it's mild, you don't even treat these people. Most, most people that have IgA nephropathy are so mild, you don't, they don't need any treatment. You'll do more harm than good if you give them glucocorticoids. So you, what you do with those people if they're not sick, if you just pick it up because you found blood in their urine, is you just watch them periodically. <laughs> Make sure their creatinine doesn't go up. Maybe get a second opinion from a nephrologist. Um, but if their biopsy looks dangerous, um, or if they have significant proteinuria, then you treat them like you do any other of these with um, glucocorticoids and ACE inhibitors. Lupus nephritis, generally, um, this is a glomerular disease. We said a while ago that it can also present as a tubular interstitial disease. Um, it's um, it's the prototypical immune complex nephritis along with IgA. Um, and th this, is, this has been known for a long time. The antibodies, the 
cause the double-stranded DNA antibodies that cause the inflammation in the, in the joints um, is also causing inflammation in the glomerulus. If they fix complements, so DC3 and C4 are low, um, and there's a massive classification of this histology. I mean, it's just, it just takes up entire books. So what you do is you find, the, you get a biopsy, you find what it is, and then the nephrologist and the and the uh, immunologist um, take over care of the patient and deal with how to, how to treat it. Um, okay, infection-related, um, I think this is our last group. In the past, there was a disease where after a streptococcal infection, patients sometimes got glomerulonephritis. It was called post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Okay. That syndrome still exists. Some people who get strep pharyngitis two to four weeks later get glomerulonephritis. That still exists. But we quit calling it post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis because over the past 30 years we've noticed that it's also being caused by staphylococcus and it's also being caused by E. coli. So there are other infections that are causing this illness. Now the things that are different is that if you have Staph or E. coli, which is also causing glomerulonephritis due to the antibody response, it happens simultaneously. That's the thing to remember. Post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis is always delayed two to, two to four weeks. Staphylococcus, E. coli, infection-related glomerulonephritis, is usually simultaneous with the infection. It's an immune complex mediated disease that the, the uh, antigen is from the infectious agent. Uh, some part of the infectious agent is, is the antigen against which your immune system is reacting um, and it may or may not fix complement. Uh, usually requires a biopsy to distinguish it from other causes um, and you treat it by treating the infection. Remember no proliferative glomerulonephritis. I don't know. On internal medicine boards, we had to remember that this is a pathology in the mesangium and the endocapillary proliferation, along with thickening the basement membrane, but I doubt it will be on pants. It is present with um, nephritic syndrome, usually nephrotic syndrome. Um, it's, a, it's a diagnosis made strictly on biopsy. There's nothing that will distinguish them um, except for their urinalysis and their edema uh, on physical exam. And the only treatment is, un is uh, treating pathology, usually with um, steroids. And then um, cryoglobulinemia, we need to talk a little bit about. Cryoglobulins are immunoglobulins, usually IgG, that um, can be IgM, but these are immunoglobulins that um, are associated with inflammatory syndromes. They are, um, they precipitate at temperatures below 37, which is why they're called cryoglobulins. They precipitate in the cold, or in, in less than normal body temperature. There are three types. Type 1 is monoclonal IgG. That's Waldenstrom's. Did uh, Selby talk to you about Waldenstrom's microglobulin? Did anyone in hematology talk to you about Mac Waldenstrom? I would remember Waldenstrom's because that's the old terminology that might be on pants. So Waldenstrom's is a cryoglobulinemia type 1. Type 2 is polyglonal IgG associated with hepatitis C. Polyglonal, polyclonal just means that there are multiple uh, uh, types of IgG involved. It's associated with hepatitis C, that's the thing to remember. And type 3 um, is polyclonal IgG, IgM associated with infections including hep C. <coughs> One of the things to take away from today's lecture is that hepatitis B and C can cause a lot of mischief out there. They can cause a lot of, cause a lot of mischief that isn't related to the liver. 
The lady I presented to you before, who's the infectious disease, couldn't figure out the end of the told me that she had hepatitis B five years ago. For, no, it wasn't five years ago. Three years ago, it was like six months after she got to the Caribbean, she had hepatitis B, she had an acute infection, she was yellow, and then she got well. So she currently did not have active hepatitis B, she had senescent hepatitis B, but the hepatitis B probably stimulated this vasculitis that she presented with. It was probably related to the, the hepatitis B. So these viral hepatitis, B and C primarily, can cause all kinds of mischief. Thank God we're over. <laughs> God. It's miserable, isn't it? It's just miserable. All those names. Uh, I don't know of any other way to do it but to tell you what's in there. That part of my textbook just sort of looks like a rattlesnake when I try to open to that area. Yeah. <laughs> Smash it. <laughs> Questions about these ridiculous glomerulitides? Just remember, you can't really tell what's going on in that glomerulitide until you get it under a microscope. And you figure it out because they present with edema, they present with really bad looking urine. They've got red cells, white cells, polymorphic, dysmorphic red cells. Red cell cast, white cell cast. Um, they, they got bad here. All right. See into that. That's all there is to know about that.